how many people here, just a show of hands, how many people here have somebody they love, care about very much, and they're not a Christian? Anybody? You got some? All right. Why does that matter? Well, this came up in the Bible study last week. It's a good question. We get, no matter what I prepare, most of the time, we spend most of our time there on questions that people ask, but that's good because we're trying, you know, we've got people that have all different backgrounds. Uh, when I was a kid, we assumed that everybody went to Sunday school, everybody knew all the basic stories of the Bible, and that's not true anymore. So we're just trying to kind of level things out and go over the important parts. Here's why you should care. When we die, if we are a Christian, we close our eyes here, we open our eyes in heaven. It's just a transition. There's the Lord Jesus. He goes over our life to give us rewards for the things that we did that He, that he wanted us to do. And it's a wonderful life forever. And all your loved ones, anybody that loves Jesus and you've loved, they're there. For the person who has never, who has rejected Jesus, who has, has heard the message, knows who Jesus is, and says, no, we're not yet. I'm unsure. They're going to close their eyes here. They're going to open their eyes just like the rich man in the story about Lazarus who was the poor man and the rich man. And Jesus tells us this story. The poor man, who nobody wanted, whom the rich man, the poor man would lay outside the front door of the rich man's home. And the rich man wouldn't even give him the crumbs off his table. The dogs, which the Jewish people did not like in those days, and many times there were wild dogs for scavenging for food, did come and lick the sores of this man. They, the dogs had more compassion than this rich man had. So when he opened his eyes, he's in complete darkness. He's in extreme heat. He's by himself. He's in a great deal of pain. If you can ever think of the time you've been the most thirsty in your life, <coughs> take that and multiply it by 10, and he is dry as dry could be. And worse yet, through this chasm that nobody can go across, he sees the poor man <coughs> in heaven with Abraham. <coughs> That's what happens if you haven't accepted Jesus, if you've rejected the Lord. Now, after the millennial rule of Christ on earth, <coughs> Satan's turned loose one more time. And then there's a white throne judgment. Jesus judges the world. He's told us, all authority on heaven and earth have been given to me. The books are open. All the books of everything everyone's done. Your life is reviewed. And then you see Satan and his demons, the fallen angels, thrown into a different hell. And this is a burning lake of sulfur. And they're thrown in there, and they live there eternally in eternal pain. And that's the last stage of hell. That's why it's important to save somebody from that. You can't make them love Jesus. But that's the Holy Spirit's job. But it is important that you present Jesus to them somehow. You know, you don't have to quote scriptures. I mean, if you have the scriptures that the Lord gives in your lips, great. You just tell them why, what Jesus has done for you. Why do you care about Jesus? Why do you love Jesus? <coughs> That's Jesus knocking on the heart. And the Holy Spirit, if they've made that person ready at that point, because right up to the moment of death, you can still be saved. You can still go to heaven instead of hell. We see that with Jesus on the cross. 
and, and the criminal's next to him. And the criminal says, remember me in paradise, Lord. He just believes. And Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise this day. <coughs> You've got the last moment of life. You can accept Jesus. Believe in the name and ye shall be saved. That's what you're saving people from. That's why it's important that we have outreach. It's also important because Jesus made us for community. We are the body of Christ. He is our head, but we are the body of Christ. And the whole body functions a lot better than some little toe running around out there can't find. You know, when you're out there by yourself, generally you don't have much of a voice. You're not generally, you're not generally get much done for the Lord. You make yourself feel good. Well, I watched it on TV. Oh, you know, I looked at it on an app. That's all fine. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. But that does not replace community. God made us for community. He made us all different and yet the same. He made us in variety and yet the same. And he loves everyone, the good and the bad. And he tells us this over and over again. So I love the evil people. I want them to change their heart. There is nothing that you could have done in your life that will stop Jesus from loving you if you invite him into your heart. Nothing. So for one thing, don't be so busy. Don't be so busy making a living. And as Will, William Barclay said, 19, or in the 1900s, that you forget to make a life. That's one of the things the world tries to do to us, that we have to try and, it's, it'll get us so busy, and then we get anxious, and then we get depressed, and then we can't even hardly get out of bed. And Christ will heal you of that. I've seen it over and over and over again. All the healings we've had in this church, every healing for depression has been successful. Every single one. Yes, I do. Yeah. Well, it's uh, we all have we all have some kind of bad habit in our life, something that's inhibiting us from being having our full joy with the Lord, and and maybe hurting us physically too. For instance, if you drink drink too much, it could be a lot of things. It's not just that. Today, uh, today uh, with with. Computers and all these modern things. I mean, you press one button, you can have pornography up if you want it. Press another button, and you can order some drugs. Or, you know, you just, just whatever you need, you can get. At Alice's restaurant. You remember that one? <laughs> you can get anything you want at Alice's restaurant. Yeah, Satan was in. He was the cook. <laughs> cook and a cook. So help people every chance you get. You don't go, hey, do you love Jesus? Oh, I'm not. <laughs> and it's like, can I help you with that? Be helpful, because Jesus tells us to love everybody. And he tells us to be kind to everybody. And he tells us, I'm going to pound on this today. He tells us not to hinder anybody. Mary and Martha. Remember, they're Simon the Leper's children, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And they're sitting in Bethany. That was Jesus' king. That's where he'd go when he wanted some peace and quiet. But still have people around. Mary's sitting at the foot of Jesus. So Jesus is teaching the disciples. Well, women aren't supposed to be there. Um, guess what? Jesus had a lot of women disciples. And money-wise, the women put more money into that than the men ever did. <laughs> so there's Mary and Martha. And Mary is listening to Jesus and, and drinking in what Jesus is explaining about how to love and help people. That's what we're supposed to do. It doesn't matter whether we like them or not. Jesus tells us even 
to love, help, and pray for those that we hate or we think we hate because as Christians we're called on not to hate. Not to hate. To forgive everybody. No matter how miserable. Heck, Jesus. Pharaoh, when Moses is trying to get Pharaoh to release the Hebrews, God gives him ten chances. Ten chances to repent. To do the right thing. So Mary is in the kitchen. And she's she sees all these people. And she's the older. She's responsible for the home. So she's in there working. And I'm sure none of you have ever done this. But she's in the kitchen and she doesn't have any help. And she's starting to grumble. And she's starting to feel sorry for herself. And she starts to say, darn it, they're all out there just sitting there. And I'm in here doing all the work. Oh, my mother-in-law, the wonderful woman, she was a saint. She put up with me. <laughs> she's a saint. But she had a hard time because she was a Martha. She was a Martha. Ethel would just, the minute she came into home, she was a wonderful hostess. Didn't matter if she didn't know you, didn't matter if you just met you for the first time in her life. So Martha has had it. You ever been there? I've had it. I'm going to go talk to these people. And Jesus, you know, tell, tell her to get in here and help me. And he's saying, Martha, what she's doing is the important thing. You know, we'll, we're not going to starve to death. It'll be okay. we got to wait a half an hour for the mac and cheese. It's okay, <laughs> you know. Don't be anxious and troubled by the tyranny of the urgent because Satan does that to us a lot. Pray daily. I won't ask for hands. But hopefully at some point in your life you have a mother or a father or somebody in that position, stepmother, stepfather, aunt, uncle, that you love very much. And you made it a point when you got bigger to try and call them every single day. I don't know, Father God tells us he's our father. Not only he's our father, he's Abba, he's dad. And of course the Jewish people that heard this were outraged. That was blasphemy to them. They had a different picture of God. They saw him as a strict, stern man that was always, you know, and that's how some religions today see God. You know, a, a, a taskmaster and a very difficult, please, if ever. That's not God. That's some false God. That isn't our God. That isn't Jesus. So just like you call your loved one each day, Pray to your loved one in heaven each day. And he will make things happen. Try not to be judgmental. That is so hard for us. Try not to judge. We see somebody that we don't like. We see somebody that we think we're better than them. And we see somebody smoking on a property and we think that's just a terrible thing. <coughs> Don't judge. The Lord is judge. If we judge harshly, that's how we will be judged. If we show mercy, we will be judged with mercy. See, the Pharisees, they were, they were hypocrites because they had a preoccupation with external matters in religion. And their dishonesty, their judgmentalism, their pride, their spiritual blindness, these people were all show with no substance. They talked, talked, but did not walk the walk. 
and they also inflicted a heavy spiritual burden on the common people. And we want to be careful that we don't do that, that we do not inflict burdens on anyone. That's a point Jesus makes throughout the Bible. Do not hinder a fellow believer. Do not hinder a child. Do not hinder an ill person. Do not hinder somebody that has a broken soul, a broken heart. We might not like the habits they have. We might not like the way they dress. We might not like the way they talk. But Jesus loves them just as much as he loves us. So we're not supposed to worry about the world, what the world thinks of us. We're to worry what Jesus thinks of us. Because we are his hands and feet. Jesus loves you. So you are called to love yourself, because that's another problem that a lot of us have. We don't love ourselves. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, you're going to love your neighbor, but as yourself. If you don't love yourself, how are you going to share that wonderfully with the neighbor? And the neighbor is anybody you can walk into, come into. If Jesus loves you, you can love yourself. We're told over and over again, God is love. The greatest commandment is love. Love one another. By your love, People will recognize you as disciples of Jesus. People will recognize you as a church that follows Jesus. Stop worrying. Give all your concerns to God. For He is sovereign over everything. Jesus says, I've been given all authority on heaven and earth. So give them your concerns. It's okay. If we start focusing on earthly values, we start getting caught up, you know, in all the busy, busy, busy stuff, we gotta learn how to prioritize and we ask the Lord to prioritize. And the next thing we get again is anxiety. The Lord oversees everything. Don't worry about things. The sovereignty of God, Jesus is our King, relieves us of worry. Rest secure in the Lord. Remember that there is great joy in heaven when one sinner repents. In Luke 15. There's more joy than 99 righteous entering. And we're supposed to be bringing in a lost sheep. So when we get a lost sheep and he or she comes to us, we have to go out of our way to be kind and loving to them and be flexible with them, not to say, it's got to be this way, it's got to be this way, it's got to be this way. No. All people are going to appear before God, whether they believe in Him or not. Every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess. We all stand before Jesus. For us, it's the Bema Seat of Jesus in heaven. But for others, it's not so nice. And it's also eternal. All people will be held accountable for how they live their lives. For the Lord is a just judge. And he doesn't like to live on sin. That's why one of the hymns I really like is, Are You Washed in the Blood? Because 
Jesus died on the cross so that every single person who was alive then or ever will be alive until, until we go back to paradise, because that's where the Bible tells us that's the whole story. We're given into paradise, we mess up. So now we have kind of a fallen world. It's not as nice. There's, you can still see God's beauty, but it's tarnished a lot. And then when Christ returns, and after that, paradise returns, heaven and earth join together. And we see your loved people, we see your loved animals. Read Isaiah, is one of the places he talks about that. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Yes. Will you accept? Yes, 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 from a recently baptized lady, that is correct. You are washed in the blood of the Lamb, Tisha. <coughs> and I hope, I, I seriously hope that every single one of you are. If you accept Jesus into your heart, you're washed in the blood of the Lamb. So when it Lord when God, Father God, looks at you, you're in robes of white. There is no sin present. It might be in your back pocket in your wallet, but nobody sees it. Because you're washing the blood of the Lamb. He sees His Son, Jesus. He sees Jesus in you. And we're every day to try and come a little closer to being like Jesus. That's a goal we should have each day. Try and be a little more like Jesus. We won't get it right every day, but we get it right a lot more than we do if we don't try at all. We celebrate the Lord's Supper every week. The early church, uh, when Jesus had first, Jesus was the one who created the church. He created his body. Those who belong had communion every single day. And in their case, because some were rich and some were poor, they made sure that along with that, everybody got a full meal every day. The early church had only two sacraments, the Lord's Supper and baptism. Only two sacraments, that's what the early church it. And they were, remember the early church had the apostles at their head. And then as they moved in, as, you know, down the road, then we had students of the apostles. So the first 300 years were difficult in some places, but it was good. There's something that ought to shake up a little bit. But remember, he loved you. Jesus knows we're going to sin before we even sin. He knows what we're struggling with. And he can see when we're getting a little weak in some areas. But he still loves us and he still has compassion on us. But that's one of the reasons for the Holy Communion each week. That's your chance to get right with the Lord each week. So the first thing that we do is for you to kind of look inside yourself and say, Lord, is there, is there any sin that I need to commit to you today? Give to you, Lord, ask for forgiveness. And repent. Ask the Lord to help you if it's one of those repetitive sins. Ask the Lord to, to help you uh, get rid of it. And that's one of the things that Celebrate Recovery does. It's a great, it's a great mission. Forty days after Jesus died on the cross, went down to the ground, went down to hell, preached to the lost, came back, resurrected on the third day. It's a picture of baptism. We die to our old life. We go under that water. We're dying to our old life. We're coming up in a new life with Jesus. 